Hi guys, in this video, we're finally going to go into backpropagation and compute the derivatives of the neural network. This is maybe the most math heavy topic uh, of neural networks. So you might have to watch it a few times in order to understand this. Um, and also you might decide that you don't really need to do this because as I will explain, frameworks do it automatically for you. So maybe I explain a little bit more about this. So we saw what neural networks are, and we said that the third component of neural networks is an optimization technique, and usually it's stochastic gradient descent, but uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, requires the gradient. It requires taking the derivative of the loss with regards to the weight. So we kind of skipped over how to actually compute these derivatives. In this video, we are going to compute these derivatives by hand, but usually this is too much work, and it requires uh, recalculating and reprogramming uh, for each new problem. What frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow allow you to do is they do automatic differentiation. So they do it automatically and you don't need to actually compute the derivatives. Uh, but we will touch upon automatic differentiation in a future video. Still, uh, I think it's quite important to really look under the hood and see how do you actually um, compute the derivatives for neural networks, for this gradient descent algorithm in neural networks. So we will do this. This is called backpropagation or backprop for short. And we will start with a simple example. So suppose x is two dimension. We have a two dimension for the x and also a bias term. Uh, we will denote the x as a row vector. This is very important. And the reason we are doing this is because we will move from a single observation to a batch of observations or to an entire data set of observation. And so it will be easier for us if the axis will be a row vector. Okay, the first hidden layer has three neurons and a sigmoid activation function. And then the output layer has one neuron and a sigmoid activation function. And it, this gives the predicted y. And then we take this y and we calculate the loss and we take the real y's and we calculate the loss. Okay, so we have the x's going in and the loss going out. There are a few ways that we can denote the weights. Here we will take input output. So here we'll have weight one and here we'll have weight two. So weight one, since it transfers from two dimensions to three dimensions, yeah, two inputs here to three neurons here, it will be two by three matrix. And the bias will also be a row vector because the x's and uh, these quantities over here will also be row vectors. Okay, so in this case, it will be b1 will be one by three. Okay, and so let's call name, let's give names to all these quantities. So the linear layer, it takes the x, it projects it with the weight matrix, and then it adds the bias. And let's call this quantity Z, Z1. So Z1 are the inputs, yeah, are all these inputs to the neurons before uh, the activation function. Then we do the activation function and we do it element-wise pair element in the vector of Zs. And this we will denote by A1. Yeah? So all these outputs after the activation function, we will call A1s. And then Z2 will be, um, and then Z2 will be the input to this output layer, and A2 will be the output of this output layer, which means that A2 is actually uh, equal the y hat in this case. Okay, so this is the structure and the names that we are giving it, and we can denote the loss uh, by L. Um, we will look at a single observation. So I will drop the I in the beginning, but usually uh, it's pair an observation and then we accumulate it later. So Li is the loss of I and we will use the binary cross entropy. It's this thing over here. Basically what it means is that if your Y are one, you really want that your ex uh, predicted value will also be one. Otherwise this term will be very, very large. This term will be zero anyway. And if your y's are zero, this term will be zero. And here you really want that your predicted will also be zero. Otherwise, this term 
will be very, very large. OK, so we need to find the derivatives of the loss, which is what we are trying to optimize, with regards to the different weights in the network. So the different weights are the Ws and the Bs. And for this, we have to use a few rules. Uh, the main rule is the chain rule. So let's go over these rules. So what the chain rule says is that if you take the derivative of the loss with regards to the weights, it's as if you take the derivatives of the loss with regards to this intermediate quantity uh, A2, and then take the derivative of A2 with regards to Z2, and then take the derivative of Z2 with regard to W2. So this is basically what the chain rule means, and I won't go into more depth. Maybe check out some calculus uh, videos if this doesn't make any sense to you. OK, the second rule is that the derivative of the loss with regard to something, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's W1 or A1 or X1 or whatever, will always be the same shape as that something. So if I take the derivative of the loss with regard to W2, it will have the same shape as W2. OK, so W2 here has the shape 3, 1. So the derivative will also be a 3 by 1 vector. Another rule is that element-wise operations uh, will give you the same shape derivative. So if you take a vector and you pass it through an activation function uh, and you do it element-wise, the derivative will also be the same shape of that vector. And then the chain rule will be done element-wise, what is called the Hadamard product, and it's denoted by this. So if I want to take the derivative of L with regards to Z, I can break it down to the derivative of the loss with regard to the activations, and then element-wise multiplication times the derivative of the activation uh, with regards to disease. OK, another rule is that if I have a row vector times a matrix and I take the derivative of that uh, with regards to the row vector, it will give me the transpose matrix. And it doesn't matter if we are looking at the x's or we are looking at the activation. So, so we start with an x for the inputs, but as we go down the layers of the neural networks, our inputs to the next layers, to the next linear layers, will be the activations from the previous layer. So we will treat the a's as if they were our x's, as if they were the inputs to the new layers. Okay, and what it means, it means that the derivative of the linear layer, because this is usually will be part of the z, yeah? so the z will be this plus the b's, uh, so the derivative of this linear layer with regards to the inputs uh, is this matrix transpose. And what it means is that as we take the derivatives and we go back from uh, Zs to As, we have to project back to that level. Yeah? So if I look here, yeah, so here the Zs were one, right? It was one dimension. If I want to go back to the As, I have to project it uh, with the transpose matrix, with W2 transpose. So I will uh, take the one, multiply it by a one by three, and I will get uh, one by three, okay? And the same from here, if I want to go from the Zs to the Xs, then I will have to project it back by multiplying by W1 transpose. So I will have a, a one by three times a three by two, and I will get back a one by two vector, which is what I want. OK, and here we won't need this, but with longer networks, we will need it. So it's important to know. OK, so this was this rule uh, over here. OK, the next rule, uh, I wrote it like this. And this is wrong. OK, this is not real uh, matrix calculus. So here I have a vector. Yeah, I have a row vector times a matrix. So it's a row vector. And I take the derivative of this with regard to a matrix. So what I actually would get is a third degree tensor. So basically a matrix, but in 3D. But as we will see, it will be as if uh, we only need this vector here transpose and moved to the other side of the equation. So we will actually get an outer product. And doing this outer product will give us exactly the same solution as multiplying by this big tensor. And this is why we don't need this big tensor. So let's see why is it a tensor. And if this is too much math for you, it's OK. Just skip ahead to the next part. So let's look. Uh, suppose we have this 1 by 2 input, and we are multiplying it by this matrix, which is 2 by 3. And ignore the bias for now. 
Uh, and this gives us the uh, outputs of the linear layer, which are denoted by Zs. Okay, so these are the individual Zs. And so suppose also all the derivatives up to here are denoted by these quantities over here. Yeah, so we, took, we look at the derivative of the loss with regards to Z1, of the loss with regards to Z2, and with regards to Z3. So now we will have to take the derivative of Z1 with regards to each one of the elements in this matrix. So this will be a matrix. And then we will have to take the derivative of Z2 with each one of these elements in the matrix. And this will also be a matrix. So it will basically be these three two by three matrices, which can be, I don't know, expressed like this, okay? The thing is that if you actually compute these quantities, then you will see that a lot of them are zeros because Z1 does not depend on W12, okay? It doesn't depend on it, okay? W12 only affects Z2. Uh, and the same goes for other quantities here. So this will be the actual matrix that we will get. And now if we want to take the derivative of the loss, let's say with regard to an individual W in this matrix, yeah? So let's say W uh, ij, then we have to take the derivative of the loss with regards to Z1 times the derivative of Z1 with regards to W i j plus the derivative of the loss with regards to Z2 times the derivative of Z2 with regards to this W i j and the same for Z3. But if we'll actually calculate it, we'll see that only one term here won't zero out. The rest will zero out. So for example, for W11, yeah, we will get uh, this thing times this thing, and this thing is x1, but then this thing times this thing, this thing is zero, and this thing is zero. So these two will cancel out and we'll just get this quantity over here. Okay, and if we do it for W21, we will get this quantity, and then for W12 is this quantity. If we do it for all the Ws, in the end, we will get this matrix over here. And we can separate this matrix into an outer product an outer product of a two by one column vector. Okay, so it will be our X transpose because we said X is a row vector times this row vector of the partial derivatives of the loss with regards to Z. Yeah, so this one by three. And it also makes sense. Again, we, we start with two one times one three, we are getting a two by three matrix. So this is why, and welcome back if you jumped up to this part, uh, it's enough not to calculate this tensor uh, of derivatives. It's enough just to take the outer product and consider as if the derivative of this is just this X transpose or A transpose just as an outer product. And so this is what we will do. We will take the derivative of this to be X transpose time the outer product, okay? So it will either be X transpose in the first layer if we are taking W1 or it will be A transpose for all the other layers. Okay, and again, very important. Uh, we won't put it on the right like we did up to now. So it won't be so it won't be this times this on the right. It will be on the left in order for it to be an outer product. And finally, the derivative of a vector with regards to itself is the identity matrix. And why do we need this? We need this for the bias. Yeah. So we, we want to take the derivative of the loss with regards to Z times the derivative of Z with regards to the B. But uh, what is Z? Z is just um, A W plus B. Okay, so this doesn't, uh, depends on B. So just this part depends on B. And if we take the derivative of B with regards to B, we will just get the identity matrix. It will be a K by K matrix. So, so if B has three elements, this will be a three by three matrix. Yeah, And so this is the quantity that we will get. 